Welcome to this online event from the British Library. We're absolutely delighted tonight to be celebrating the publication or the recent publication of Geoffrey Blatch's Musical Truth, A Musical History of Modern Black Britain in 28 Songs, recently published by Faber. So it's a refreshing and fantastically readable uh, journey into modern British society, ideas, and the music that soundtracked the last eight decades. I urge you to pick it up and uh, book by the book through the tab at the top of the screen where it says books, if you get a chance. Uh, the reason we're doing this at the British Library is you may not know, but you may. It's the home of the National Sound Archive of six and a half million sound recordings. And amongst those recordings, of course, there are music from every genre and every culture, every format you could possibly imagine. So we like to talk about music as much as we possibly can, and we present talks and we present performances on our stages. And over the last few years, you could have caught everybody from reggae legends, Lloyd Coxone, Dennis Al Capone or Dawn Penn, through to Jazzy B, to Jocelyn Brown or Akala. So um, always things going on, please do check out, check out our website for more information. Um, and then tonight, our event is hosted by Janessa Williams, who is a journalist based in Leeds, who writes for the NME, The Guardian, for Galdem, and many other places. And she's also an academic whose work is focusing on the intersections between music and the socio political and personal identity. So it's going to be a fantastic conversation, and I will now hand you over to Janessa. Hello, hi everyone. Um, welcome, albeit virtually, to the British Library. My name is Janessa Williams and I am thrilled, absolutely thrilled, to be playing a host tonight to Geoffrey Boche to discuss a little bit more about his latest book, Musical Truth. Um, as we've already mentioned, I couldn't recommend purchasing your own copy more. It's available via the books tab at the top of the screen, where there are also tabs to give your feedback on the event and to donate if you'd like to support the works of the British Library. So for those who do not know, Geoffrey is an author, broadcaster, commentator, journalist, trainer, English teacher, um, all manner of things whose work often centers on issues surrounding race, masculinity, education, and popular culture. Originally raised in Brixton, but now living and working in Yorkshire, a journey not dissimilar to my own, I first discovered Jeffrey's work in 2017 with Hold Tight, an incredible history of grime music, which he then followed up in 2019 with Blacklisted, an exploration of the many labels that are aimed towards members of the Black diaspora, always knowing when to balance a complex challenge of derogatory labels and segregation with some much needed humour and self-recognition. In 2019, Jeffrey co-authored What is Masculinity with Darren Chetty, applauded by the Schools Library Association Information Book Awards as a means for young readers to, and I quote, find hope beyond the negative rhetoric. All of this brings us up to today to celebrate the release of Jeffrey's fourth book, Musical Truth, released by Faber on the 3rd of June and beautifully illustrated by the award-winning visual artist Ngoni Smart. It's a wonderful, accessible book that can be enjoyed by young people and adults alike. A history lesson you can dance to, I've heard it described as, which I love. In 2022, Jeffrey will take this conversation even further with his next book, I Heard What You Said, which will be an in-depth look at racism in British schools. So timely and necessary in its research that it actually created a six-way bidding war amongst potential publishers. So as I'm sure you're understanding, Jeffrey's work asks some fascinating and important questions about what it means to be black and British. And I, like so many of you, I'm sure, I'm fascinated to hear more about its genesis. So that's enough from me. Jeffrey, thank you for being with us today. How are you? Well, Janessa, um, I'm, I'm feeling great. Thank you um, for, for hosting and for that great introduction. I've been busy, haven't I? You've been very busy. I've been busy. <laughs> Extremely. I don't know how you do it. We'll, we'll get to that, I'm sure. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's start. Tell us a little bit more about Musical Truth as a book. Where did the initial idea come from? What does it kind of set out to achieve? It's quite simple, really. I mean, as, as you said, a, a lot of my work centres around race and popular culture and education, right? And those three lanes I'm constantly switching between in my thinking in my writing I'm a teacher so I spend all day talking to the next generation right 
And I realized that the big conversations surrounding race and identity that I'm just having the whole time with peers, with academics, with uh, other artists, it's a conversation that wasn't being unlocked in schools at all because the curriculum basically doesn't go there, right? Completely. And, yeah, and I've lived that curriculum because I was at school in this country in the 80s and 90s, then I grew out of it and I went back into education to become a teacher. So I've seen how the education system as it stands doesn't really enable people to get into the conversation. So I figured, look, at some point, I'm gonna have to do something to try to speak to people at school and also speak to educators as well, because you can't tackle a problem unless you see it and you can't really see it unless it's shown to you. So Musical Truth, at the very core of it, that, that, was, that was the idea that led me to, or that motivated me to want to write something like this. Um, and then, and then it became a question of, well, how do you get into that conversation? Do you write a history book? Okay, fair enough. I could do that. Do you write something personal? Do you write a novel? And I just circled right back to what I love, which is, which is music. And it felt like a no brainer at that point to think about the way that music intersects with history and narrative. Thus, musical truth. If that's not too long winded an answer, we're working. <laughs> No, that's great to hear. And I mean, I completely agree. The fact that music just feels like such a perfect vessel to have some conversations that might feel difficult or some conversations that carry a lot of very emotional burden often. And I think the thing that struck me most as a reader of the book was how successfully it manages to kind of deal with those potentially very difficult and quite upsetting stories in a way that does still feel suitable for young people. Because I think so often, you know, we dampen things down for young people or we explain them in ways that feel a bit patronising. Um, but, you know, it's a book that tackles Windrush, Stephen Lawrence, all of these things. Um, how do you personally strike that balance between kind of being age appropriate, but also obviously giving the real yeah. musical truth of the matter. I'm, uh, that, that, is, that, that is so important to me as a writer, right? Because essentially, when I start getting to that space of how do I say this, how do I say that? What's the right way of saying this? Am I gonna say too much? Is it gonna, I just think, well, actually, hang on a second. What's just true? Let me just say, tell the truth. Rather than try to be right, I just try to be true. And I don't wanna patronize mm -hmm. people. I've seen what happens when you patronize kids. Like young people aren't stupid. No one, <laughs> no one's stupid, right? but, but kids are not stupid. They know exactly when they've been spoken down to. They know exactly when they've been lied to or when things have been withheld from, from them. So what I do is I just go with honesty. I try to break the fourth wall. If something's mm -hmm. difficult to talk about, rather than not talk about it or try to manage it into something that is easier to talk about, I'll just say, this is really difficult to talk about. Yeah. But it needs to be said, if I don't have the answers, like, whoa, it, imagine that an adult not having the answers. You just say that, like, there are no easy answers here, but this is what happened. And I feel like that allows the conversation to be more honest, because mm -hmm. then you aren't, you aren't trying to control the conversation. I put truth in the title for a reason, because I just want to show people what actually happened. And then from that starting point, then you can get to working out how you feel about it before you even think about changing it. You know, so um, that I think in a way that allows me to be freer in my writing because yeah. I'm not doing a spin job. I'm, I'm not leading with a persona. You know how when you're at school, you get textbooks and you don't even know who writes them. It's just like a mm. text turns up and the voice is just some random like teacher voice in your head. I was thinking, what's the point in that? So I started Musical Truth with like, hello, my name is Jeffrey because... I want people to know that there's a person that's experienced things behind these ideas and that the narrative that I'm exploring or the narratives of communities I'm exploring is running alongside my own very personal narrative. And you as a reader have your own narrative too. And hopefully we can find some common ground there. So, so yeah, not patronizing people and um, leading with integrity. And that hopefully gives me some confidence as a writer. Yeah, I think you can completely feel that, that sort of, conversational element um, where you can hear the voice in the head but you also feel like there is space for you to talk back to um, and that's so so important and I think like particularly maybe this is just a bee in my bonnet that I have like being a music journalist but I feel like so often 
what I do is kind of patronized in a way of like, oh, you're just writing about entertainment. Like, right, this right. Is, you know, there's entertainment and then there's politics. But I think yeah. like the book proves and so much that's gone on that you've written about prove that the two just overlap in such a neat way. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's like to, to, to me, it's, um, you know, I've, I've experienced a whole curriculum outside of school through black culture. But I learned yeah. so much about what it means to be black and British, what it means to be African, to be West Indian, to be Afro-American, things that were just were never presented to me. And I learned it all through culture, through mm -hmm. music, movies, conversation, fashion. And what's interesting is that that culture like holds weight. It holds a lot of weight, you know, it's it's got currency. Um, and so to marginalize it as something which is just merely entertainment is to miss out on everything that those cultures hold. There are whole stories in there. There are whole narratives in there. There are whole histories in there. Um, and I think that, you know, those stories, the way that music can kind of encapsulate that is, is just amazing to me because it always feels like now when you listen to music, it always feels like present. Which, are, which is something that I try to bring to my writing about music. I want it to feel alive, you know, you're in, you're in the moment, you're listening, present tense. Present tense, Janessa. <laughs> present tense <laughs> always. Yeah. As, as you were researching, did you learn anything that even you didn't know previously? Or like, cause you, you know, talking about how you hadn't been presented with this stuff in schools, but you kind of learn it through culture. Was there anything that came as a bit of a shock or a surprise to you? Oh, yeah, lots and lots. Like. I thought I'd done all my research, you know. I'd, I'd already written a couple of books about this kind of thing, you know. Yeah. That listed was 100,000 words. Are you serious? And then, <laughs> and then suddenly, when I was, what was it? When I was researching um, Winifred Atwell, who's one of the earlier artists in the book, we're talking about the 40s. Um, and then I got into the, the, uh, the No Colour Bar dances in Lambeth. I, I grew up in Lambeth. That's the borough that Brixton's in. And it turns out that a massive no color bar dance, which is like one of the first political social events where, you know, white people and black people were invited to dance together as a show of solidarity. That mm. happened in the town hall that I passed every day going to school. I couldn't believe it. So I'd seen this town hall my whole childhood. I didn't know what it was. I think it was just like council offices, but that just blew me away to think that there was all this history on my way to school. Like I would pass Electric Avenue and I didn't know yeah. one fairly recently that, that was in, you know, that that, that was what the the um, the song by Eddie Grant was inspired by. Mm. So, as I've got further into some of these stories, some of these little historical factoids that I didn't realize were so close to my life, they were just jumping out at me. So that's amazing because it showed me again just how alive all this stuff is. It was right in front of my face for years, and I didn't know it. Yeah. You know? It's it mad, isn't it? The stuff we overlook because we just like see it every day. Yeah, 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 exactly. And there was no one telling me as well. There was no yeah. music truth when I was at school. That <laughs> just did, did you know? That would have been cool if I'd known that when I was a kid, but you know. I would, I would have loved that textbook. Yeah, yeah. Me too, me too. Oh well, oh well. We have it now. <laughs> We've got it now. That's <laughs> the important thing, isn't it? Um, thinking about like how this process differed to your other books because like you say you know blacklisted was obviously like this long kind of extended prose thing and this is broken down into the 28 songs um do you think you found this process easier or harder to kind of write within a sort of individual segment all right good question he says as he thinks of the answer no the, <laughs> the issue there is that blacklisted i found really hard to write because i had to really rip apart everything i thought about myself as a black person and really think hard about what is my identity as a black person and what are the other identities that relate to my experiences. And that was just, that was a difficult on that level. Musical truth was really hard because the whole time I wanted to say a lot and I wanted to say it in a way that felt really easy. Mm. I thought blacklisted was quite easy to read, but it turns out that some people, like people have read it, reviewed it and just said, that was the most difficult thing I've ever read. Like, oh my God, I didn't know. Um, a lot of non-black people actually read that and thought it was it was hitting them over the head with hammers. They were like, oh my gosh, mm. I'd never thought about that. So I really thought if musical truth is going to be intergenerational, if it's going to be accessible, I need it to... I was being a DJ. You know how a DJ like wants people on the dance floor? 
You want the DJ, you want the party to be just bubbling along. You don't want people to be thinking hard about, what's this track? Do I, can I dance to this? Is it a bit too... You want them to just be in it. And the next thing they know, they're in the middle of some crazy music that they didn't even know they liked. I put that hat on. I wanted to DJ my way through it. And that was quite hard because you've got to really think hard about the ebb and the flow, mm. you know, the rhythm, the tracks, the tones, the genres. Some of those choices were not obvious choices. Like if you, to if you told me like 10 years ago, I was going to write a, a book about Black British history, would I have thought that Immigrant by Sade would be the Sade track in there? Probably not, you know. Yeah. Skunk and Anti have been in there? Probably not off the top of my head. But there's a reason why these tracks made it in because they helped tell the story that I felt needed to be told. Mm. And they had a certain um, cadence that, that, that led to or contributed to the entire piece. Yeah. 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 Jeffrey the Selector. <laughs> 100%, 100%. It's all coming out now, isn't it? You can tell, it's like, oh, he used to be a DJ. Okay, now I'm just, all right, all right. <laughs> but no, the, the transitions are, are so, so important. And I was really curious, actually, about how you whittled all of these songs down, like the balance between things that meant a lot to you and things that meant a lot yeah. to the story. You know, there must have been stuff that you could have or wanted to write about that didn't, didn't make the Oh, up. man, there were so many tracks that... I went for about, um, through about a week's worth of just nostalgia tripping. So yeah. all those songs from my own childhood, I was like, oh, I'm gonna do that one and that one, Boney M, Rivers of Battle and Billy Ocean. And I just thought, hang on a second, I'm not sure if I'm serving the piece here, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so the unedited version would have definitely been 200,000 words long, 100%. <laughs> it would have been a history of modern Black Britain in 48,000 songs. <laughs> <laughs> Here is my iPod. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, so it was, it was, it was quite a challenge to edit. Um, mm. But then I just had to. Then I just felt like I wanted to be in service of those wider narratives. You know, I, I always find just on a sort of like personal level, I'm better when I'm in service to someone else, because then I drop all of my thoughts and my and my fears and my ego and I do the thing which is truest so I thought about what am I writing this book for what am I trying to say which stories are important and I let that steer me and that's how you get smiley culture in there that's that's how you get skunk and Nancy in there that's how you get moany love in there you know because because there were things I need to say about particular points mm, yeah no I can completely resonate with that um, and we've obviously discussed the importance of the title and how, you know, by nature of its title, it does deal with some hard to hear stories. But also I feel like we really should make clear that it is a book of great joy. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's all those things. It's it's all those things. Um, I think that's, that's when art is special, I think. And totally. when you've got that combination of joy and celebration, but also uh, pain and trauma, but also resistance and protest, which I think is at the core of a lot of music. You know, there's a reason why every, it's the same story, isn't it? Every like five years, there's some new moral outrage over the next genre, you know? Ah, yeah. oh, gangster rap is gonna, ah, oh, grime is, ah, oh, UK drip. And it's like the same story going back to whatever, you know, um, rude boys from Jamaica are doing this, ah, oh, rock and roll, you know, jazz musicians. So, and I think what's interesting there is that there's something about, music popular culture youth culture as well which is pushing back at society yeah sort of like pushing at what society tells you is right and true and that's how society evolves because you get to the point where rock and roll just becomes mainstream like i bet that the most mainstream individuals people that are in government and stuff like listen to rock music without mm. understanding that's black culture you know like, so it's it's an interesting thing that music allows you to celebrate and also to to protest and to comment on society and to document it too that's yeah the fourth thing it's really interesting actually where we're at at the moment with um kind of like the pop punk thing like that's had a huge massive resurgence but seeing people of color taking up space yeah. or i suppose taking back a genre that began with them has been super fascinating 100 percent, 100 percent. I like that. Are you into pop punk? I'm a huge pop punk yes. fan. Always and forever. My chemical romance, yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <coming out> now. 
but again like it's it's mad to me now that like I'm interviewing people I'm speaking to people I'm just like if you were around when I was 15 like my entire life would probably be different to be honest like having had someone who kind of looked like me and I guess one thing particularly in the book that did really resonate with me as a as a 93 kid um was the entries for Craig David and So Solid Crew because I feel like both of those were just so visceral to my like own memories of the kind of garage era but particularly I think as someone who you know is mixed race did grow up in Stevenage which isn't necessarily known for being the epicenter of musical <laughs> excitement like having Not someone who was from Southampton <laughs> was kind of like whoa you know it can be done yeah yeah so That's that, it. yeah that, to me that that was that was such an important moment because when you say so solid, we think about like what, when Craig David and the Artful Dodger got mainstream and when so solid yeah. that year, 2001, whatever, like I was, I was at uni just when that hit and I was at uni in a place that was nowhere near London. And I saw posters of the so solid <laughs> crew. Like people were like, knew what they looked like before the internet was really, like they knew yeah. what Asha D looked like. They knew what Romeo looked like. It was mad. Cause these are just, these are just, like people from Battersea, you know, <laughs> they were on pirate radio. I listened to them on pirate radio. They're yeah. like, whatever. So it was such a thing for me to see this very UK specific bit of like black UK going into the craziest like mainstream place, like into mm. the stars. It just feels like um, that was a real turning point, you know, and the fact that everyone knows those songs. Like yeah. everyone's listened to UK Garage. It's on everyone's playlists. Um, it's just, yeah, it's a really special moment in, in time. I think it's going to be recognised like just how powerful that was for mm. Black Britain, you know, because it because it was just, and it led to, obviously it led to where we are now because it takes us into, in a weird sort of way, it's into grime. It takes us into UK rap, into Afro bashment, Afro, you know, it was also it all kind of started around that UK garage jungle era. It was yeah, crazy stuff. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, sorry. I just got <laughs> it was a it was a great time to be an eight year old. You know, <laughs> I had I had my Romeo poster from Top of the Pops magazine. I had a Craig yeah. David in top, of like, in top of the Pops. So yeah, no, I... the Pops magazine. <laughs> Literally, they were everywhere. It was it was great. Yeah, yeah. no, good times really good times who were the artists that I suppose were making you feel most seen personally can you uh, remember yeah that is a good question because you know like I'm 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 a cons I'm a fan right that's my sort of default position so I wasn't ever in the scene mm -hmm. I never really looked like the artists that were making it. What I'm trying to say was that I'm not cool. Like, I'm, you know, like. Yeah, you are. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but cool in that way that you're not, you know, I was cool. Like, I, I kind of hung out with anyone. I was a bit like a prototype hipster. I was one of those kids, you know, like an early version of a hipster, you know, I wore like Hawaiian shirts and stuff rather than like tracksuit. So I was, I was always, always looking at culture from a slight angle. Mm. So, I was just always fascinated when, when I saw things that I thought were underground start to become overground. That was all, to me, that was always an interesting moment because as I said, like a lot of these cultures, a lot of these um, cultural artifacts, the mainstream doesn't care about them. Like mm. black people in this country is like, you know, 3.1% of the population, it's, it's tiny figures. The impact culturally is obviously much bigger than that. Um, and the historical significance is obviously way bigger than that, but it's small enough that you could just be overlooked. I grew up in Brixton, so I was surrounded by, by Jamaican culture. You know, my yeah. parents were from Ghana in West Africa, but I was surrounded by Jamaican culture. So it was always fascinating to me to see the things that I thought were, you know, not mainstream start to make it into these spaces. So I suppose I, I, I felt very represented whenever I would be watching something like Top of the Pops. And, you know, when I first saw um, General Levy on Top of the Pops, like, I don't know, man, like, Brixton, 94, that summer was taken over by that song. It was coming out of, like, buses. There was just be, like, the bus driver with 
dreadlocks and you just hear it coming out of like a little speaker. It was coming out of people's flats. And then when he was on top of the pops, it was like people were just clogging up the landline going, General Levy's on top of the pops. Like it was crazy. So those moments felt like the community that I was part of being seen, just being mm. recognized. And that was just huge, you know, for me personally. And I suppose a similar thing happened later on when, you know, cause I started listening to Grime before I knew what Grime was, like it didn't have a name. Yeah. And then suddenly it was like all over the internet and stuff and people calling it Grime. And I thought, bro, oh, this thing that me and my friends just listened to is like out there. And then you started to see these like superstars coming out of it. So those, those moments were like watershed moments, you know, where, where something big has happened, like there's a bit of step up. You mm. know? Yeah, definitely. And I feel like that's a really core cool part of the book as well. The, the kind of movement between the underground and the overground and mainstream, but also that really important recognition that African and Caribbean diasporas aren't a monolith. And obviously everyone's experiences are completely individual too. And even, you know, black music as, as you address in, in the introduction is, you know, something that people kind of refer to, but it's so encompassing of different genres, different styles, different expressions. Um, and I know that that's, that's something that you're really passionate about, but I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about how you try to accommodate for that kind of multiplicity in your work because obviously you know you're one person like you can't speak to every every experience but how yeah. do you sort of try to reflect as much as possible yeah I just I just get nerdy about it and start looking nice. at the, the the links the the heritage the interpolations the interpolations the history of and that that to me is is as good as paying homage because when you understand that there are these interconnections between genres, you know, that one thing didn't exist in isolation, you get this richness, which you can mm. really celebrate, you know? That was, that was actually, that's why I wrote Hold Tight, because I realized that grime was becoming, it was in newspapers and stuff, and no one was talking about the various black um, cultural, like art forms that contributed to that narrative. So people yeah. were talking about grime and they weren't talking about jungle and they weren't talking about dancehall. And I was like, are you insane? So I thought if I don't write a book to explain where I think grime comes from and where it sits in the wide narrative, it's gonna get lost in history. It's just grime came out in 2003 with this album. And then and it's like, no, 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 no. So it's out of respect really. Um, and that's how I try to, that's how I try to um, kind of, position a particular moment I think about well what's its context and yeah. when you go back 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 what is it linked to and I personally believe that's why a lot of music which is produced by a lot of contemporary artists and stuff outside of like pop which is just pure pure product has got such richness to it I mm. think that if you don't understand where it's all coming from you can just feel it you can feel it's got it's got deeper roots than you might know or that or then you might be able to see and that's what makes it kind of alluring and that's what gives it weight and integrity so so I just I just fly the flag for that and uh and yeah and it keeps me interested too so yeah of course it does um and I know like I've been super grateful to kind of have your books as a means of that context for stuff like I'm not super knowledgeable about grime but I finished the book and suddenly I was like ah oh, it all makes sense <laughs> how have you found kind of navigating the publishing industry as a black writer because obviously you know so much has improved in the last couple of years um, I feel like the last year particularly people have really realized the importance of making more space for people to tell their stories but from your perspective as someone who's kind of right in it what work do you think still needs to be done in order to make the industry really inclusive and kind of more than just, you know, a token book deal about this token trendy yeah. thing? Yeah, yeah. Um, it just comes down to, listen, publishing like every other institution, you know, is suffering from the same institutional isms that, mm. that society is wrestling with. So it's not controversial for me to say that publishing is is not inclusive it's not diverse enough and i'm not just talking about what gets published talk about the people within publishing yeah because, you know i'm a firm believer that 
institutions don't exist like as embodied as disembodied entities with their own mind it, they're just full of people man. and if these individuals within the institution haven't got a diverse range of experiences or haven't got the ear for a diverse range of like narratives then how can they even be expected to include these marginalized voices and you mm. see it in everything you see it in healthcare you see it in education you see it in publishing you see it in entertainment theater whatever um so there's so much there's so much of a long way to go my way of coping with it is really it's kind of tragic because i just have to be excellent um yeah <laughs> sorry to break into everyone <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's my only strategy i've just got to be really good like i produce whole manuscripts that are like good you know yeah. like, oh, well, another one i'm like yeah because if, if i don't write another one that's good i'm not going to get the time of day so so i just i i just really push but that's part of the that's kind of part of the black story which mm. is fortunately still true to this day that it's a cliche but the whole work twice as hard to get half as far thing is it is true that yeah. is coming out um yeah. So you are you are witnessing someone who is like burning at a crazy intensity because <laughs> I fear that if I don't, if I was mediocre in my output, uh, it would just get washed away, you know? Yeah. I mean, well, I was going to ask because I can't tell you enough really how inspired I am by your commitment to balancing books, journalism, teaching, research, all of this stuff. But like, honestly, that must like do you do you have a secret some of us don't know like is there 12 days in your week like how does this happen um everyone asked me that question I, I don't know man um I think I, I think it's again it's clocking what is important yeah and really clocking it and in doing that because when it's important then there's no no like it it is going to happen in the yeah. same way that when you want to watch that program on Netflix, you watch that program. It doesn't matter what else is going on. You watch it. If you want to eat a Kit Kat, you eat a Kit Kat. Like, so I've got to work out what is important. And then I only really think I'm going to pull the trigger when it's really important. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. And I think that motivation then allows me to make the most of all the little corners of my day and stuff. And, you know, I wrote the first two books while I was holding newborn, newborn babies like, at three in the morning. <laughs> that, that, that was the only time I had crying baby in one arm, laptop in the other, writing a book, you know. Um, so yeah, so yeah, sorry, that is definitely not the secret. It's <laughs> not going to have kids, like, that, that, that's not what I'm saying here. Go and have a new <laughs> baby, <laughs> and then you write, you write a book. But, um, but yeah, just uh, leading with integrity helps. Mm, yeah. yeah, and the teaching must inform it so much as well in terms of, you know, seeing what the kids yeah. want to talk about, what they're not hearing enough about, all of that stuff. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's a real privilege, actually. Like, teaching could be a headache because mm. it's run by people, uh, young people as well, who are like, <clears throat> but um, at the same time, it's a real privilege to just be in proximity to people that are living in the, in the zeitgeist that you're not, if you, yeah. if, if you know what I mean. That, that's just a privilege. Um, and I find it fascinating because the worldview is so different to what you think it is. Like people think they know what teenagers are like, but if you actually talk to teenagers, you get a very different set of responses. And that's why popular culture is always interesting to me because popular culture is like, that's what kids are looking at. You know, kids are very yeah. interested in what's happening now and things get out of date very quickly to a younger audience. And some things that you think are out of date are very relevant to younger audiences. It's really fascinating. So. I just find um, I can't quite shake teaching as a place in which I can explore the world, you know, by going hand in hand with like the next generation sort of thing. Yeah. That's not really, uh, that, that was almost cheesy, that was. That was almost, <laughs> almost. You say cheesy, I say, you know, moving. It's, okay. I, I think you're right. I think you're completely right. Um, did the students have like feedback on songs to include? Or like, did you did you test the waters with any of the ideas? Um, I didn't actually. Um, I I sort of mentioned it. They were very interested in the cover. Yeah. Like, know what it's going to look like, and they were very interested in like the later songs, the ones they recognise because mm. it's a nostalgia trip. It's a song sure. that it's, it's a book that when you see the playlist, you instinctively think, oh, that was when I was. Oh, that was you know. So when they got to the two thousand tens. 
a lot of the kids are like, oh, wow, and you're like, oh, you got Dave in here, ah, you know, they just lose it because they're used to seeing stuff from their lifetime in a book about history. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But apart from that, no, um, I didn't really poll many kids about what to, in- or what to include. Yeah, this is musical truth part two. I feel it. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I feel it coming. Sound like my agent. Oh no. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, let's go on with it. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. Um, It's funny actually that you mention Dave because obviously the book does take us up to the modern day. um, And I feel like with both Dave and Stormzy, you kind of have these two phenomenal examples of artists who I feel have really demonstrated what, what it means to be young, black, but also quite unashamedly political. Mm. Um, and I wanted to talk just a little bit about those two songs and kind of what made them such distinctive choices to you. Um, and I suppose how you think they reflect a bit of a changing relationship between politics and yeah. youth. Because obviously it's always been there, but I feel like now is a particularly charged moment for that sort of engagement. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what it is is that the predecessors of like that era were sort of in a way they were kind of like apolitical not that they weren't political but they didn't explicitly lead with their personal politics mm. so you never really heard like who's Mega Man voting for like you, ne- you know you never really thought about yeah. it you know um but then you get these this next generation who were sometimes very pointedly political like they would be name checking politicians they like literally calling out prime ministers in their bars, like mm. what, like talking about Theresa May, Boris Johnson, um, Zach Goldsmith in their tweets and stuff like that. So it's interesting because those those kids, to use a patronising term, because they're not kids anymore, but they they sort of came up in in an era, and they're the kind of product of an era, and they're suffering from the same issues that have afflicted certain communities for decades. You know, like uh, uh, urban poverty. Um, an education system that that struggles to meet the needs of certain communities that excludes black kids at a higher rate than non-black kids all of those issues and they've come out of it and they've somehow managed to get a platform which to talk about it and I think yeah. that in itself is really really important so the fact that you've got artists who feel empowered enough to say something about the worldview and to give their worldview, to tell us what it's like from that position, that in itself is worthy of celebration. And in the fact that beyond that, they can actually influence change and make change. I think that's hugely important. So the last three tracks were all about that. You know, it, go, it kind of goes from Stormzy and being a symbol of a new sort of politics and a new empowered sense of black youth Dave, who just writes these beautiful dissertations about, you know, black identity and politics and culture and society. George, who right when the whole world was talking about race and identity, wrote something or put something in into the world that wasn't just asking more questions, but was like an example of where the conversation could be going next. Mm -hmm. I think that was really important to me. It felt like not a conclusion to the book, but a sense of we've turned a bit of a corner here and yeah. look where we could go now, you know. And then also, um, if you if if you listen to it as well, if you listen to these tracks, like the final track has got this 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 kind of beautiful um just tonally, just the music is confident, it's assured, it's not like grime in 2003 which was spiky and abrasive and it felt like frenetic and angry the music been produced now by um by a lot of black artists it's just wonderfully kind of beautiful you yeah know? the quality of the music is so high some of that stuff from 2003 sound like people like kicking drum kits down the stairs you know yeah. I, I like that sound i can't lie it sounds like sirens and synthesizers getting thrown out of windows. I like that, right? But then you've got this other wave now of music, which is just like beautiful, you Mm. know? So if you go back to my DJ hat, ending on black would have been okay. Yeah. Piano, the thing, but then you move on to Black and Ready by George and it starts to kind of soar. 
you know? It's Completely. Got, it's, yeah. And I think it kind of starts a new conversation because there's a new confidence while asking the same questions. So yeah, that's, um, I don't know how we got into that diversion, sorry, but, but, <laughs> but that's, I felt very strongly about just making sure that the readership will be hearing the future, you know, yeah. as well as hearing the questions that have come from the past, if that makes any sense. Absolutely makes sense. Um, and actually speaking of kind of future voices and future ideas, you've set me up stunningly for a beautiful segue <laughs> because we are incredibly lucky to be joined actually for the last part of this chat by George himself, the man, the myth, the legend, um, a rapper, singer, artist, and producer from Croydon whose 2020 song, Black and Ready is the final song on the playlist. So George, if you're lurking in the virtual green room, um, as we're calling it, do do feel free to to pop on in. Hello, hello. How's it going? Welcome. How are you doing? I'm good. I was just listening to that conversation. Like I was proper in the conversation as just as a fan, first and foremost. Just like, oh, this is just a great conversation to hear. There's so many gems in there, and I'm listening to you talking about Craig David. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I was about <laughs> nine, I was about eight at the same time, so yeah. Yeah, I guess we yeah. must have been around the same age. Yeah, I'm ninety four. I'm ninety four, so a bit younger. Oh. <laughs> yeah. no, I feel like the old one. No, no, no. <laughs> Craig David was definitely a bit of a cultural reset. I feel. Hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. He's like for me. He's one of the most important artists to come out of Britain. I think. The juxtaposition of him and So Solid at the same time. Yeah. It's like you have both sides. You have a bit more soulful, a bit more R&B, but then you have the hard-hitting, unapologeticness of So Solid. So for me, that was like, I don't know, it's something that I base my music off now. A lot of it is, it's like a beautiful juxtaposition of being good, bad, and everything in between, being like rough, smooth, and everything in between as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about Black and Ready. Like, it must be pretty cool to be featured in a book, right? <laughs> that's pretty you know sick. What? I feel like that's one of the first things my mum is, like, really, really proud of. She snatched it <laughs> off me as, as soon as I brought it home. Um, but, like, so Black and Ready was more... So my birthday is the 6th of June, right? And on the 6th of June 2020, I went to protest in London. Mm -hmm. um, and I went with two of my school friends who I've known for about 10, 15 years. And there was just a big feeling of like, being annoyed, feeling the right to protest, but at the same time feeling like a bit tired of doing the same old thing. Like we, we protest all the time. These protests happen every few years. There's always some sort of need to protest and there's always some songs that come out of it and people think, oh, this is a really cool song. And then that's that, like yeah. it kind of moves on. And I think at the same time, it was a period, I, I got home and I wrote the song just from a place of like, I just need to get this down. It wasn't to release, it wasn't for anything else other than that therapy for myself, to be honest. And I didn't want to release the song at first. I didn't want to put it out because I felt like I'd be like cashing, on, cashing in mm. on a moment for self gain. And I didn't really believe in that, so I thought, I spoke to my label and I said, the only way that you guys are going to get this song and you guys are going to be able to release this is if we can donate all the profits from this song to some sort of something to help build the black community. Because I think as, as good as it is to talk about these things, as good as it is to have these conversations, like I'm tired of it. I've been having these conversations for my whole life. So let's just do more. I'm a solutions person. Let's start doing more. So we, I decided to donate all the profits to the black curriculum. Amazing. Which is very charity. Yeah. You know, bring um, they're promoting the use of Black history in the in our national curriculum and trying to make that happen. And yeah, and then once the song came out, it was like I don't know. I just felt overwhelmed by everyone else saying that they'd been through similar circumstances because a lot of the song is just me talking about my personal experience. You know, a lot of things that I'd seen and experienced in as a black man growing up in South London and seeing how many people have um, had the same, uh, had the same things happen to them was quite, it was heavy, if I'm honest, but yeah. also it was pretty cool. Like I had people saying that 
I was never the best. I was always smart in class, but I was never the best behaved. I had a lot of people saying, oh, we're going to talk about your song in class. We're going to study it. And now I'm in the book and I'm like, oh, wow, this is for someone who dropped out of university twice and <laughs> didn't make it through college. So, you know, it's, it's um, yeah, it's a bit it's a bit of like a full circle privilege moment, making me feel like I've given something to the world, you know? Yeah, yeah bit of a um, start from the bottom moment to borrow from yeah. a Canadian cousin. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny isn't it this whole idea of like not wanting to cash in on the moment because like I very much felt that too and I, it's so strange because it's like it can't really be cashed in on a moment if it's you telling the truth of your own experience but it does sort of it can feel that way um, very acutely and it can also feel very much like when you're doing well that that attention's kind of coming from a place of I suppose sort of like a bittersweet place of like, oh, why are we all suddenly talking about this now um, <laughs> rather than always? And I guess that must have been something to really kind of cope with with that song in particular. I'm always of a place where even when people contact me about things, I'm, I'm always coming from a place where, okay, this is good, but how is this actually going to benefit people that take this in? Are people going to be educated by it? Is it going to financially benefit other people? Is it going to help provide some sort of jobs or some sort of anything for the people that come after me because it's all well and good like me taking the plaudits and it benefiting my career but if I walk through the door and I don't hold it open then mm. like what's the point in me walking through the door in the first place do you know what I mean so totally yeah yeah, yeah. it's um it was a it's, it's very bittersweet bittersweet is the best word to put to to sum it up actually yeah yeah, yeah. man it's such a yeah it's just I'm just listening to you and just it's amazing because obviously, you know, I choose a song, never met you, never heard the narrative, never heard the history. And it's just amazing to hear you detail where you were at at the time and what was going on at that point. And, and yeah, it's like, I just feel like just what you said there about how you wanted the song to land and how you wanted it to be received. Just the most important thing is just people having the opportunity to, to say their truth. Mm. Yeah. I feel like that's so important. And, and if you never felt like you could put this out there, if the gatekeepers kept the gates closed so that those voices could never be heard, then we can never push forward. So I, 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 I just feel like it's so important that the things get heard. It's so important that they get shared widely, that we support. And I'm just... I'm just happy that your mum's happy too, you know? <laughs> I just put a smile on my face as well. That's, I haven't had the chance to read it yet. My, mom, my mom's reading it right now and she's taking long, so I'm like... <laughs> We've just got to keep the mums happy, haven't we? Like, I feel like everyone wants to keep their mum happy, but particularly in the black community, I feel like your mum being happy is like, that's it, you've made oh, it, you know? And even like, I'll put out a song and it'll be a great song. She'll be like, oh, I love the song, but Jordan, you swore. <laughs> and I'm happy with that. So, you know, I think even in this song, I swore. And um, she was like, Jordan, I love the song. Like, she cried when she heard the song. She felt so. Uh -huh. There's a lot of, it's weird because a lot of the stories that um, I spoke about in the song, I haven't even told her about. I hadn't mm. told her about. So her hearing the song was like the first time that she'd heard that I'd gone through some of the things that I've been through. Like, for example, being, you know, stopped um, and searched by police when I was like 14 so many times. Yeah. There's so many times that that's happened and yeah, it's just weird. You don't really, you don't really talk to your mum about it and nah. it's not really something that, it's not about not being able to talk to them about it. It's more like from a place of, I don't know, embarrassment, shame, like this happens to everyone so it must be normal. And then even like having conversations with my dad where he's like, okay, this happened to you. When I was young, this happened to me and then blah, blah, blah. And then this, you know, lineage, but like, Coming back to your point, as in uh, Jeffrey, about being able to speak my truth, I think the music that I've listened to has always, and that the music that's resonated with me, even that like the books I've read, the poetry I've listened to, has always come from people speaking their truth. Like I've, I grew up reading like Benjamin Zephaniah, and he was always someone that went against the grain. One of the one of the my favorite books is his book called Gangster Rap, where there's yeah. um, it, you know you know the book when it's about a rap group and they are. Similar to that, so solid, I guess. They were quite controversial, but there were people that were 
changing their own lives and changing the lives of people around them, but the public didn't necessarily understand that. And mm. I think, but the, pe- the people that mattered to them understood that, like young people, the streets, the, you know, the hood. And that's, I think when you're black and when you're making music, that's all that really matters. And then sometimes wider conversations get like, you get a responsibility that's put onto you yeah. to stay true, you know, that stay true to what you know. But then you have people from the other side saying, "Oh, you can't say that because blah blah blah." You know, this is this is violence. This is this is wrong. But if you're speaking your truth, then you shouldn't really have anything to hide. If that makes sense. So I was um, yeah, there's so many layers to it. But like you said, it's musical truths, and all we can yeah. do is. And something that jumped out when I heard your track in particular mm. was this kind of like thread of like. Um, just like community, like unity, like being proud of being black, like that that seems to be something that, that I heard specifically in that track. I can hear it in Glide as well, you know, um, which you don't always hear mm. explicitly in a lot of modern music. So when I heard that, I just thought like it sort of, it kind of made the song sort of like put itself front and centre to me because I thought this is, for the collective uplift. There's something mm-hmm. uplifting about the way that you were looking at that community and commenting on it and documenting it, you know, and also telling your own story. And I feel like that's really important because that's something that a lot of black people that I know will feel that and talk about it. And it's evident in various black communities. It's not always the thing which big mainstream gatekeepers want to put front and center because it's not always the most commercial thing. It's not always the most, it's not always the most, you know, exciting thing, you, you know. Now like people will talk about So Solid Crew and they'll talk about the violence and demonize them. They'll talk about the flashiness, they'll talk about the edginess, but they won't talk about the fact that this is a community of people who are uplifting each other. And the Mega Man was like a community leader, you know. No one talks about that, but he was creating mm-hmm. something bigger than him. And he still does, look at the Instagram, like he's all about, you know, so, when I heard that in your song, that that's another reason why I felt it was important to bookend this project with that, because that that I feel is something that the mainstream still hasn't really got its head around. Yeah. There's a collective uplift that we are pushing towards, and when that really happens, then we'll see change because we won't be like doing the crabs in a bucket thing. You know, we'll be pushing together. You know, so so yeah. Just another reason why why I'm thrilled that it's in and I'm thrilled that, that we're in Zoom here. It's just brilliant because I'm a fan, you know? It's a small, it's small progression, it's small steps. I think before we know it, we're going to be the mainstream. And it's like, so where where I'm from, where I grew up, I'm from South London, Fort Heath. And funnily enough, like I lived two roads away from Stormzy, around the corner from Krepton Cotton Wilfred Zaha, I used to play against him in primary school Dave lives around the corner as well like there's so much going on but with us and our community now we're like representing a lot of the mainstream culture and even like a lot of my family from Manchester from Salford which is where Marcus Rashford's from Mm -hmm. people like that so and those are people that are my age that are actually leading you know just just leading the way so I think with me, I'm like, so I'm seeing that happening and I'm so unapologetic about being who I am because I've seen people do that before me that are my age and it's, it's working for us all. So, like, we're just, I think there's a new found fearlessness mm. about people my age. And when I even look at people that are younger than myself, I'm like, wow, where, they, where they're where they going to take it is scary. Like, I know some, I know this girl, she's called Deborah. She was in the Glide video and she lost her mum last year. But the week after she lost her mum, she was in the Nike advert. And like those kind of things. I'm like, yeah, I think we are in safe hands, to be honest. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't fear the future. I'm more excited about the future when I look at um, what's coming next. I'm very, just the way I am, I'm very optimistic. And that's why I've made the song Black and Ready rather than Black and Angry or Black and Pissed Off because I think we're just ready for the next steps. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm excited. 
Mm. I think the the hustle's definitely real. Um, and I think like what you were saying about stuff kind of popping up all over the country is super important too, because you know, this isn't just London, this isn't just this kind of like concentric thing on its own, like it's happening everywhere. Um, and I completely agree, like from a music writing perspective, like most of the people I'm interviewing now are a good decade younger than me. And it's just like, do you know what? This is going to be fine. Like this is all, this is all good. What's going on? They're younger than you. I'm having a crisis at 28, I'm telling you. Oh like, my word. Everyone is young, young. Um, yeah, trust me. I just turned 27 <laughs> and I'm like, oh. oh, oh. <laughs> from, from both of your perspectives, like, who are the kind of people that you're looking to for, I suppose, Musical Truth Part 2, or just, you know, that to kind of carry that next that next torch of, of big songs that we're going to be talking about as really instrumental? Good question. You want to go first, Jeffrey? Yeah, I mean, I, I, in terms of music, I like to, like, keep my ear to the streets, to use an old-fashioned phrase, you know. I like to really listen carefully to what is coming out of, of the, you know, of the, of the sort of, not the realist, but the sort of the, what's been created in those places that haven't got the spotlight on them yet. You know, I'm always fascinated by that because I feel as though it's usually communicating something, even if people try to dismiss it as just being, oh, that's just um, glorifying violence. That's just um, a remake of that genre. It's usually communicating something. And these are artists as well. So a lot is a lot gets talked about, say, UK drill has been a problematic art form. Mm. But the artists making this music, first of all, they're artists, they've got personas, and the evolution, you start to hear it over time. The subject matter starts to evolve, you know. So I heard a drill track the other day, and it was a love song just a 100% straight up love song. I thought, okay, UK Joe's making love songs now. All right, all right. And then as people get older, you start to hear other things. There's a reason why your artist, like, I don't know, for example, gets, he was just the angriest kid, like just angry, just angry at everything. His music is now so deep and mature and wise, you know, because as you grow, you get wise, you learn things, you speak to people, you see a bit more of the, of the world. So I'm always interested in what the, the youngest people who are starting to starting to interact with the world, how they are perceiving it and what they say. And I like to take it warts and all, you know, I'm not here to sanitize music because I think that's a real risk. People go, oh, you can't say that. Oh, that's just that. Society is full of problems. Like society is riddled with issues and we all get born into it. And actually some of that, some of those problems like will get relayed through art. And it's our job as responsible listeners and adults to not just like tell people off, but to try to understand where it's, where it's coming from, you know? And then I feel like you can start to see a bit of the future and then just stick with it. Like let it grow, let things grow. So I'm just, yeah, that was a very long answer to a short question, but I'm just like listening out for interesting things coming from lots of different places, man. But yeah, that's yeah. me. No, I think that's um yeah, you summed it up. So I, I own a studio in um in East London mm -hmm. and we what we've been doing recently is teaming up with a bunch of schools and charities to get the kids to come through and just record. And some of the stuff that I'm hearing, I'm like, yo, these guys are these guys are 14. And when I was 14, I, I had like a four pound microphone from Argos <laughs> in my living room. Like the worst technology ever, but these guys want to hear and not even necessarily the stuff that they're saying, but the way that they know the technology about how to make music and they know to put a course there, or they know, oh, here's, here, here comes a middle eight. And I'm like, back when, when, it, when I was 14, all I did was write bars constantly and hear the, and then, okay, this two bars, we say that four times into chorus. Whereas they're like, oh, yeah, if we say this, we say these lyrics, it might build up and then it will cause. The transition to here and there and I think there's this one kid in particular called Ide who came in um one week he came in and he'd been robbed for his for his phone and um he was like he was raging wanted to go back and find the guys and we said listen just chill here stay here an hour make some music he ended up staying for about four hours mm -hmm. which was 
you know, that's that's the reason why I do what I do, you know, to, to, yeah. just to help, just to serve, just to serve other people coming after. But the stuff he was saying, the the maturity that he had, like he was a very level headed guy, a very respectful person, but he's got some growing to do. And I think, like you were saying, Jeffrey, you got society has to allow people to grow because yeah. if yeah. people were judging gets on the music that he was making in 2008, he wouldn't have made it to, to, to 2020 and he wouldn't have had that album that went number two. And similar to myself, if people would like judge me on who I was in 2008, then I wouldn't have ever made a song like Black and Ready. Um, yeah. And, you know, uh, it's, it's very interesting seeing what comes next, but at the same time, a lot of these people were still, they're still raw. They're still saying a lot of things that may not be true. They're still fabricating some things to seem cool which is fine as long as we let these people grow and become who they're going to become. And I think what's very interesting actually as well is how many people um, listen to myself and, and Dave. And when I hear young people quoting Dave, I'm like, Dave is like really, really important to these people, man. Like he, he's like you were saying before, he's edu they're educating people on politics. They're educating people on black history. They're educating people on things that it took me go in Jamaica and go in Africa to like learn about these stuff. Whereas they're getting the first hand experience through music, yep. which is uh, you know, that's that's super important. So like I said, I'm not I'm not worried at all about where um where the future is and where the future is going because we've got good people ahead and we have good leaders to lead them as well. Hmm. Yeah. We're in safe hands, I think. <laughs> We're in safe hands. We're in safe hands, yeah. And what about both of yours uh, respective futures? What's next for, for each of you project-wise? <laughs> the magic question. You're like, give me a break. I've barely done with this one. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. No, um, like I said, um, I'm... I'm on a bit of a mission, you know. Um, I feel like there's work to be done in society in general. Um, I'm committed to education, um, holistically as well, not just like schools, but the concept of education. Like, you can't have another generation coming out of school not knowing certain things. You can't have another generation not understanding the impact of certain national stories, certain histories. So I'm, I'm pushing in that direction, definitely. And... Um, my books are definitely in that lane. Um, I've got all sorts of other projects as well that I can't tell you about, you know, secret projects. You know how it goes. Um, we love we'll a secret out. project. We'll find out in, <laughs> in, in time. But yeah, um, I, I think, to, to, to be honest, it's, it's good to know what, what the mission is. Right? And I feel as though I'm, I'm clearer and clearer and clearer about what it is I want to say and what I want to, the, the, the impact that I want to have um, in this society that, that I'm part of. So everything is pulling in the same direction. I'm just going to try and do my bit, connect with people that are having the same conversation, um, put work out there that will help people to be part of the conversation um, and be a, like a translator for the conversation for people that can't see it as well because that's what I do as a teacher like I'm the person that has to get you to think about stuff that you don't necessarily know you want to think about so I'm just going to carry on being being a teacher in the grandest sense of the word you know while the hair gets greyer and greyer <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think that's a wonderful way to put it I really do yeah I think the to, honestly very similar like I'm, I'm here to I just see what's wrong and I try and fix that in the best way that I can. So like one of the a passion project that I've started recently is I'm, um, I was looking at the price of school uniforms, yeah? And I just thought, this is ridiculous. These are way too much. I remember my mum, do you know what I mean? When I was year seven, my mum bought me a, a, a blazer that lasted me until year 11 because it was that expensive. So um, me and a friend of mine, we've, a launch, we're launching a company called Pick Me Uniforms, um, where we are going to be uh, providing free school uniforms for kids that are on free school meals. Um, so it's like, as well as releasing my music, and I've got a, I've got a single coming with DWE, and um, oh, yeah. yeah, I've got a single coming with DWE. So then I've got the uniform project coming out after that. 
Then we've got the album coming. And then I just, I, 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 there's a lot. Jeffrey, we, I know when you're saying you work hard, I know what you mean. I know yeah. exactly what you mean. But um, so there's like so much going on. But I think the underlying theme to what I want to do is just uplift. And you know, I've, I've processed my trauma. I've processed my trauma as a black man. I've processed my trauma as a man. And now I'm not here for like wallowing in my sorrow anymore, to be honest. I'm here to just uplift and, and change what I can change rather than just feeling down all the time because if we all was living in our trauma we'd all be sad all day whereas I want to let that like, power me on and drive me to do better for myself and for those who are coming after me yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> amen <laughs> amen to that I feel like you know I feel like we could talk about all of this stuff for hours but I also feel like I've got to let both of you off this call so you can get on with the absolute mountain of stuff that you know we've got to achieve um I can see all of these things and more coming from from both of you I really can and you know both both your music jobs and and the book um both are so incredibly special and important to this uplifting journey um so thank you both so so much for your time I've got to say as well, I've got to interrupt you as well, but for yourself, what you're doing as well as a black woman. Exactly. That you're, that in the industry that you're in, that yeah. can't reflect on at all, because, you know, like, I believe being a black woman in any industry is more difficult than anything. So you being able to conduct this conversation is yep. like a massive, massive thing in itself. So, yeah, hats off to... Major. Thank major. you. A pleasure. Absolute yeah. pleasure. Come on. That's huge. It's huge. 100% co-sign that one, man, definitely. Yeah. Um, and doing it so effortlessly as well, Janessa. <laughs> I try my best, you know, like you say, I'm, I'm out here working working twice as hard, you know? Well, yeah. You didn't answer the question either, what you're working on. I know you've got what, some stuff what, in the pipeline. I know you have. Me? What am I working on? Wow, yeah. okay. Um, so me is kind of similar really in the in the teaching sense you know I'm halfway through a PhD I'm hoping to also enter the academic field I guess at the university level but we'll see what happens you know it's a it's a big old field out there who knows you know hopefully books we'll we'll see like, I mean we've got to start working on musical truth too haven't we like we, I feel like that's been decided you know <laughs> definitely definitely <laughs> amazing well like i say thank you so so much both of you for your time um and thank you also everyone to who is watching this who's tuned in um make sure that obviously you know you are getting out there supporting george's music supporting um all of the artists that are mentioned in the book via the playlist you can find that on musicaltruthplaylist.co.uk or via youtube if you put it in the search um, and also, as we mentioned before, you can pick up your copy of Musical Truth via the book tab, um, where you can also give any feedback on the event. If you enjoyed it, if you didn't enjoy it, please do um, let us know. But until then, I guess this is where we do our, our little wave in our individual boxes um, <laughs> and say, you know, thank you all for tuning in and for joining us. And hopefully we'll see each other soon and everyone else soon in a in a either a virtual or an IRL capacity, who knows, eh? <laughs> Thank you for having me. Been a pleasure. Thank you so much.